Hi, I'm Christy McDonald from One Detroit. We have a special program for you tonight, a live hour-long town hall with Governor Gretchen Whitmer on the COVID-19 pandemic and its effects on the state of Michigan. This is a joint effort between all of the local broadcasting partners to try to get as much information out about this crisis as possible. Stay with Detroit Public Television as we bring you daily updates and interviews that you can find at OneDetroitPBS.org and across our social media platforms. Thanks and be well. Less than a month ago, on March 10th, voters all over the state of Michigan knew the coronavirus had arrived here in the U.S. But with duty on our minds, we marched to the polls in the Michigan primary with the whole country watching the vote. The crowds at polling places were something to cheer, not something to fear. But before the final ballots had even been counted, Governor Gretchen Whitmer had an ominous announcement that upstaged the primary. We're here today because we have identified the first presumptive positive case of coronavirus in Michigan. The first two cases of the virus had been confirmed in Michigan, one in Wayne County and one in Oakland County. That was March 10th, 24 days ago. Tonight, we live in near ghost towns. The exponential spread of the virus has us huddled at home with loved ones while the downtown convention center is turned into a hospital. There are more than 10,000 cases of COVID-19 in the state, and they've taken more than 400 lives. Tonight, a first in Michigan broadcasting. Your questions for Governor Whitmer in a statewide coronavirus town hall. And welcome to the Governor's Town Hall. I'm Devin Skillion from WDIV Local 4, joined by my colleagues Huel Perkins from Fox 2 and Carolyn Clifford from 7 Action News as we bring you a rather unusual live event, Huel. Devin, we're sending this program to every TV and radio station in the state of Michigan right now to get as much information to as many people as possible. These extraordinary times mean that we must all keep our distance physically and yet come together for answers and understanding. Governor Whitmer and the state's top medical expert, Dr. Joe Ney Caldoun, will be joining us for the next hour uninterrupted. They will be answering our questions and many of the ones you sent to us. But first, let's hear from the governor who joins us live from Lansing. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all, and thank you all for tuning in tonight. In just over three weeks, we've gone from zero cases of COVID-19 to more than 10,000 in the state of Michigan. This virus moves easily from person to person. Even if you don't feel sick, you could be carrying it. And just one person with the virus can infect another 40, who can in turn infect thousands. Last week, I signed the Stay Home, Stay Safe executive order that directs non-critical businesses to close and directs all Michiganders to stay home. I wanna be clear, you can go to the grocery store, you can go to the pharmacy, get your prescriptions, you can go and do the critical things like filling up your car with gas or going outside for a walk, but when you are out, you need to stay six feet away from anyone else. You need to wash your hands. I want everyone to be smart. Take care of yourselves and take care of each other. Stay inside and think about it for the daughter who has asthma or the grandpa with COPD or the sister with MS and for your step. Stay home, stay safe, save lives. I look forward to answering your questions tonight. Thank you, Governor. These are very unprecedented times, so we have decided to join forces in an unprecedented way to get answers uh, to questions that are coming in from all over Michigan. Our format tonight is rather simple. The three of us will ask questions. We decided to decide who would go first in alphabetical order, but it turns out all of our television stations begin with W. So uh, after about nine tiebreakers that I won't bore you with, uh, I'll start. Governor, let's start with your announcement today on schools. We had a ton of questions about schools before the announcement today and then a bunch that have come in since. And many of them boil down to how 
haphazard everything feels right now in trying to get our kids educated. Uh, and I guess some people are wondering, there's a fine line between local control because you've shut down the schools, but you've basically left the rest of the school year up to individual districts. And that fine line between local control and chaos, do you eventually hope that we sort of all come together in a way to proceed over these next couple of months, or do you want everybody finding their own way? Well, let's start with this. You know, this is an unprecedented time, and I'm grateful that your stations could all come together for one cause. I think this is so important that people have good, accurate information. Just as important, it's critical that we are making decisions that are in the best interest of the health of our people. Working with Dr. Janae Caldoun, our chief medical executive here for the state of Michigan, it became very clear that we needed to pull our kids out of school, that kids being home, coming into school, and then heading back home was a way that transmits the virus. And we know that there's not an age group that is immune to getting sick from COVID-19. We've seen representation in all ages in our testing in Michigan. What we know is that another critical function of state government is to ensure our kids get the education that they need. Now, as a parent with two kids in our public schools, I can tell you, I've been desirous of making sure that we have a plan that meets their needs. But as the governor of the state, I also know that we have 1.5 million kids in our schools. We have over 900 different districts. This creates a lot of um, difficult issues that we needed to work through. We know that our education system is not equitable, and that's why I've written budget after budget to start to really build equity into how we prioritize and achieve a level playing field for the kids of Michigan. And right now, as we think about how do we meet the needs of our Michigan children, we have to recognize that each district has different challenges and also different resources. And that's why it's so important that our local partners who are on the front line are helping design what the remainder of the school year looks like. Some kids will be able to have some online opportunities. Others will take home uh, paper packets. Some will be getting education uh, through their computer, others perhaps on a telephone or um, through, through this paper, uh, paper packets as I mentioned. And so there's not a one size fits all for something as complicated as educating 1.5 million Michigan kids. But what we are doing is releasing a lot of the traditional structures that would have precluded us from moving forward. We're now gonna be working very closely with the um, local partners to design an education that meets the needs of our kids. And we're not gonna penalize people for having a hard time in COVID-19. What we are gonna do is wrap with additional supports as we think about what the fall looks like and meeting the needs of our kids. But I gotta tell you, right before I announced the order, I was getting a text message from my own children asking me what the rest of the school year was gonna look like. It'll look different for them than it will for other kids in the state. But for every one of them, we are gonna meet their educational needs and ensure that COVID-19 doesn't sidetrack their education because it is absolutely essential we get it right. This is gonna expose the digital divide, Governor, in a new way and a, probably a very dramatic way for many. Is there a way for us to, now that we're not spending money, say, on the electricity to keep uh, facilities running, we're not spending money on a lot of supplies that are being used inside buildings, uh, one of the questions I had, is there a way to move any of that money to help backfill things like internet access, computer access, and the like? Well, so one of the um, things that we're seeing, you know, Dr. Vitti in Detroit, for instance, is working incredibly hard with partners in the private sector and philanthropy to ensure that kids can have some access to um, educationally appropriate uh, online tools that, that they can take home, the actual computers. Um, not every community is going to be able to do that. And even in communities that are, they might not have access to broadband. And so we've got critical infrastructure issues that are gonna preclude a one size fits all. And that's precisely why it was really important that we give our ISDs and our local superintendents some ability to uh, create a curriculum that is gonna meet the needs of our children. It's alternative, it is uh, learning from a distance, but we're gonna be able to solve this in a way that meets the needs, the unique needs of kids from different parts of our state. All right, for our next question, let's go to Hugh Perkins. Devin, thank you. Governor, we received hundreds of questions, but 
it boils down to what one viewer told me. She says she's sick of hearing that we're all in this together. She's a single mother of two young kids who's now lost her job in part because of the stay-at-home order. She's not only afraid of the virus, she's afraid of losing everything. No money, no job, and now her rent is due. Governor, what would you tell this young woman? Yeah, well, I, I understand, you know, every order that I've issued weighs heavily on me. I know that when I pull our kids out of school, that means 1.5 million kids aren't getting the education that they need. It also means that 750,000 of them who qualify for free and reduced lunch aren't getting the meals that they need. That was a logistical challenge for us, but we're meeting that challenge. I know that when I had to close down bars and make restaurants dine out only, that there were people that were gonna get laid off and there are businesses that will struggle to make it. I know that issuing the stay at home order creates additional hardship. But here's what else we know. COVID-19 is a novel virus. It is incredibly contagious and it is deadly. There is no cure, there is no vaccine for COVID-19. There's a story on the news this morning about a, a special education teacher whose wife had COVID-19 and it just showed up in her as a fever. For him, he had three days and then he lost his battle and passed away from COVID-19. We can be carrying this deadly virus and not even know it, exposing our loved ones whose bodies may react very differently than ours. That's precisely why these aggressive measures are necessary. I know that there is hardship and I, we are working incredibly hard to make sure that we have extended unemployment so that it's gone from 20 weeks before to now 39 weeks. And Gary Peters was a big part of helping make that happen. We're grateful to him. We have, uh, have protections for, um, you know, so that you don't lose your home to foreclosure and that you can't get evicted. There are additional supports that we are gonna continue to work to make sure that you and your children are going to be okay during this. But this disease is ravaging our state. We've gone from zero to over 10,000. 417 Michiganders have lost their lives to this. It, that number is sure to continue growing. I mean, every one of these people had a story and have loved ones that can't even come together to mourn because it's too dangerous. These are unprecedented times and I know people are making great sacrifice. We're gonna do everything we can to get through this and to support you and your kids. Well, Governor, many are also complaining about how difficult it is to even apply for unemployment by phone or online. What's being done to handle the flood of applications? So our unemployment numbers, um, generally our system uh, is built to take in the 10,000 uh, applications that we get, we have a 4,000% increase. This is going to uh, be a challenge for us to simply keep the, the um, computer infrastructure up and running. And that's precisely why I've loosened uh, the terms by which people need to apply. You can qualify for unemployment from the day you lost your job. We will no longer require all of the onerous paperwork that once was. We've expanded how long you can be eligible. And we're waiting from the federal government for authority to um, enhance that with an additional $600 as was promised, but we need their authority to make it a reality. So on all of these fronts, our unemployment system is going to be much better able to meet your needs uh, in this time. But getting through the system can be a little frustrating. The easiest way to do it is to go online, not through the traditional phone calls, but to go online. We have a queuing system that is being set up so that we can manage the, the level and make sure that everyone's claim gets filed. But you will not be penalized for not getting it in by a date certain, so long as you're able to show what the last day was that you were employed. Carolyn? All right, thank you, Huel. Uh, Governor, thank you so much for doing this tonight. We have quite a few topics to get through during this hour. So my first question to you is about testing. Uh, with 10,000 cases as of today in the state of Michigan, uh, Governor, when will we have the ability to test anyone who needs a test and how will we get the results back faster? 
Well, we're working incredibly hard to ramp up on testing, but we need additional test kits. We're gonna need more labs to come online. We've made strides, but we still do not have everything that we need. And in order to make educated decisions based on data, we need to be able to conduct these tests. I'm joined tonight by our Chief Medical Executive, Janae Caldoun, and I think Dr. Caldoun might be able to shed a little bit more light on this. Absolutely. Thank you, Governor Whitmer. There's no question that as a country, we were late when it came to testing. Uh, because of that, we've had to limit the number of people who have been tested and specifically prioritizing those who are the sickest or those who are healthcare workers or who, who could potentially infect other people. So we are revving up as quickly as we can. We need more swabs, we need more labs, and we need more testing reagents so that we can get these tests done. Thank you both. We have a, a viewer question now, and Governor, you can answer this, or Dr. Caldoun, you can take this. Mel from Westland wants to know, how does a person without a doctor get permission to be tested after feeling ill? Part of being tested is that you have to have written permission from a doctor, right? That's right, and I think Dr. Caldoun is the right person to answer this one as well. That's right. Ideally, someone would have a primary care doctor and they would talk to them uh, first before they would uh, be able to get a test. We know, unfortunately, that's not the case for a lot of individuals. We know that our hospitals across the, the state are working hard. They have hotlines. If you think you need urgent medical care and are very sick, you can call first a hospital to identify if you should come in uh, to be evaluated to be tested. But most people, if they have very mild illness, unfortunately at this time, uh, we will not be recommending that they get a test. All right. Thank you, both of you. Uh, Devin, the next question is yours. Yeah, uh, Carolyn, I think uh, uh, my question first is for Dr. Caldoun. This is a question that uh, came in from a couple of folks outside the metro area, um, and this is about policy. Should hospitals be forced to take the overflow of coronavirus patients. Uh, what is, how is that being addressed? And uh, should hospitals take patients that they might not necessarily want in those communities? So there's no question. The only way we're going to be able to tackle this public health crisis is to join together and join our resources. We know that our hospitals, especially in Southeast Michigan, are at capacity. They're running out of ventilators, they're running out of PPE, they're taking care of patients in hallways. There's absolutely no reason that a hospital that is 90 minutes down the street can't, uh, if they have the cap capability, take some of these patients. So yeah. we already know a lot of our hospital leaders are, are stepping up uh, so that we can take the best care of our Michiganders. And Governor, this leads to a, a broader point. I, I think uh, some folks in the state, uh, outstate, may see this as a density issue. The problem is obviously uh, tougher right now in denser, more densely populated areas like Southeast Michigan. But if you're watching tonight from Bad Axe or Elk Rapids or Iron Mountain, you may be believing that your community has been unfairly dinged by something that really isn't necessarily germane to you at the moment. Well, unfortunately, if that's the impression, um, I think people are going to learn that that's really not the case. The fact of the matter is, is that COVID-19 is probably in a lot more places than we know because of this lack of testing. This has been a subject that I've been pretty vocal about because in order for us to really be able to run data, in order for us to really be able to see when the apex of this is, and for all of our planning purposes, we've got to have more robust testing. And when we have to um, prioritize testing and we have to assess who gets a test or who doesn't as opposed to testing everyone who needs to be tested, um, it can skew the, the information and give you a false sense of confidence or a false sense of where COVID-19 has already spread. The fact of the matter is, well, if you are in Elk Rapids or Bad Axe or any other part of Michigan and you happen to be a healthcare provider who's not busy taking care of COVID-19 patients but you want to um, help, we are asking that anyone with this kind of training consider coming into Southeast Michigan where the most acute caseload yeah. um, has grown already. But this will unfortunately uh, be present in all across the state of Michigan. And that's precisely why these 
aggressive stay home measures are important. We can keep down the spread. We can keep down the prevalence of it across our state if everyone does their part. And I just want to acknowledge, I got a message earlier today that um, there's a great employer in the city of Detroit, Blue Cross. They told their employees, if you have a health care background and you want to join the governor's call to action, we'll keep paying your salary and your benefits. And mm -hmm. they had almost 20 people sign up in a very short period of time. And that's precisely, I think, the kind of attitude we have to have. If you are one of those health care providers in another part of the state and you're not on the front line but want to join, there is a need in Southeast Michigan where we are making it easier for people in health care to join our ranks to ensure that um, scope of practice issues and, and the usual uh, questions that preclude people from jumping in and we've resolved them so we've made it easier for people to join the front lines because we need yeah. to have all hands on deck. And we also need the PPE to support people who are doing that. And so if you're a Michigan business or a person in Michigan who has access or has the capacity to chip in by you know, creating masks or face shields um, or hand sanitizer, we, we need your help as well. Yeah. All right, let's send it over to Huell. Governor, I know that uh, we're keeping track of the number of infections and sadly the number of people who died, but there's some viewers who want to know why we don't also keep track of the number of people who recover. In the eyes of so many people, recovery equals hope. Yeah, I appreciate the spirit of that question. I do think that, that hope is really important and there are people that have recovered. There are people that are uh, stepping down in our hospitals and, and that will be the case. And um, there are people who've been tested and didn't test positive for COVID-19. All of these numbers, I think, are um, stories that we, we could share and should share. I think they're complicated too, right? Uh, what we know is that just because someone didn't test positive for COVID-19 doesn't necessarily mean that it was a negative test. It could have been inconclusive. And so um, sometimes the numbers don't tell the full story. That being said, we're working really hard to make sure that we are transparent so that people have got accurate information with which to make decisions. Uh, we're working to ensure that we are um, sharing information in real time. And we're working to make sure that as people are conducting their daily lives, they have an appreciation for how serious the situation is. And so um, I, I welcome people's suggestions about how we can improve upon that. I think that stories of hope are incredibly important as well. I'll tell you this, um, I know that because of how rapidly this is spreading, it's very likely every one of our lives will be touched by COVID-19, whether it's a friend or a coworker or a relative who um, has tested positive or, or sadly um, perhaps didn't win their battle with COVID-19. Mm -hmm. A state representative um, just in the last few days uh, passed away and it was suspected COVID-19 and it's something that is heartbreaking. And I think that's why it's so important that we remember that each one of these um, numbers is not just a number, it's a person. It's a life that was cut short. And that's precisely why stopping the spread is our most valuable tool. And, and our stay home order is aggressive, but we've seen a map just in today's New York Times that shows it's working to keep people from being out and about, which is how we slow the spread and save lives. And so ask that everyone keep doing your part. It's not easy, but it's essential. And to Dr. Caldoun, if you get the measles as a child, you never have to worry about that again. To those who have recovered from the virus, do they have a lifetime immunity? And if so, can those same people now immune help the heroes on the front lines who may still be in danger? So that's certainly what we would hope. Unfortunately, this is a, a new virus and we're still learning a lot about it. Uh, as the governor mentioned, what we're going to be tracking in the upcoming weeks is the number of people who have recovered. Ideally, we would have a test where you would test for 
the antibodies, and then if that person had the antibodies, you would be sure that they would be immune from the virus um, as long as possible after that. Unfortunately, it's too early. I know scientists across the country are looking into that, uh, but it's just too early to tell. Carolyn? All right, thank you, Hill. Governor Whitmer, now earlier this week, you tweeted out an invitation to healthcare workers to come here to Michigan and help. And I know we're in desperate need. We reported medical professionals getting sick daily. Some have died, doctors have died. Do we know, are people answering this call? Are people coming here to Michigan as we run out of medical professionals to help with this battle? Well, we put the call out and we have gotten some um, interest. I don't have a specific number for you right now, but I will just say that um, anyone who has retired from the medical profession who would consider joining the front lines, anyone who is in training to become a medical professional, anyone who's got this background and is maybe doing something different right now but wants to, wants to be helpful, um, there is a huge need right now. We are encouraging people to consider if you've got that training to joining us to help take care of people with COVID-19. I was over at TCF um, the other day and had the opportunity to tour the facility where we will be having overflow for, for patients, a field hospital essentially. I was with the Army National Guard as well as um, the Army Corps of Engineers and it was really impressive the uh, incredible work that is going in there. We will need help to staff it though. And so this is one of the um, sure needs that we will have as a state. And that's precisely why we put the call out to saying, if you're, if you're seeing this is happening, if you have a connection to Michigan, consider coming and helping us because um, it's gotta be all hands on deck. We're seeing this number climb exponentially. It will continue to climb exponentially. Despite our aggressive efforts, we won't see the benefit of that until a little ways into this, a couple weeks, two to three weeks, they say. And so that's precisely why as this number continues to climb, we've got to do everything we can to obtain the personal protection equipment to enhance um, and grow the number of people on the front line. And so that we care for those who are on, who are taking care of patients right now, and we um, hopefully get more people to join them. Uh, Governor, I know you mentioned TCF Center. Will we need more facilities like that? I know we're opening that as a hospital, but other hospitals are putting tents out front. I know in New York they have a, a ship now to have patients away from the hospitals. Will we need more facility, facilities and more volunteers? Yes, yeah, so we anticipate this uh, COVID-19 will continue to grow the presence in Michigan and the need for hospitalization. Uh, we have seen some models that, um, you know, give, that tell us this. And so we are making preparations to have additional kind of offsite uh, places around the state. We've been working incredibly hard with the Army Corps of Engineers to find appropriate places where we can set this up. Of course, our hope is that we don't need every bed that we think we're going to. We probably, uh, we probably are though, and that's why we are getting prepared. Thank you so much, Governor. Devin, the yeah. next. Uh, uh, Governor, I want to ask you about, uh, so we had a number of questions about the stay at home uh, order. Uh, you originally wanted that to stay in place until April 14th. The president moved the federal uh, guideline out to April 30th, and then you've recently asked the legislature for emergency powers to extend for 70 days. But where are you right now on where the stay at home uh, order is in place right now for Michigan? Well, at this juncture, you know, I put the stay home order in for three weeks. We thought that that was prudent at the time. Uh, obviously, uh, information, facts, the, the presence of COVID-19 um, is becoming more known. Uh, so every day, this dynamic is, is changing dramatically. We're making decisions based on the best science, the best facts, always with our healthcare providers. Um, input and, and Dr. J's, um, you know, her recommendation always. We've got to do what's in the best interest of the health of the people of our state. And um, as long as uh, it, all the science continues to point toward 
social distancing being the most important thing that we can do, we're going to have to continue that stay home order. I haven't made an announcement in terms of lengthening it at this juncture. I was glad to see the president uh, embrace 30 days. Uh, I think that that was an important step, a, a dramatic step, frankly, um, from where they had been in the federal government. And so um, the, the extension about the state of emergency for 70 days has a lot of other implications. It's not the same thing as the stay home order. And so mm -hmm. I'm glad you asked the question so we can clear that up for folks. Um, I would anticipate that there's a possibility that I will have to lengthen the stay home order, but precisely how long it is and, and when that announcement will be made, I'm not prepared to, to say right now. We're, we're looking at it, we're making decisions based on the best information we have. Well, and you're right, that information does change. And so this next question for uh, Dr. Khaldun, we had a report come out earlier today that suggested that as we learn more about the way that this virus is spread, it may be even easier than we thought before uh, for some people to get it from others. It may be as simple as just talking to someone in a conversation or walking through what I guess you would say was their breath vapor. Do we need to revisit the six feet that we of social distancing that we've all been talking about? If there's no question that this is a highly contagious virus. It stays around in the air, to your point, uh, after someone's talking or after they cough or sneeze. I think we really need to think about, uh, everyone needs to make sure they're following the governor's orders of staying home and staying safe. We need to consider, uh, certainly if you're sick, you should be wearing a mask if you go outside, if you have one. And if you don't have one, you can be thinking about making one out of, out of cloth or using a bandana. So we absolutely should be thinking about uh, our social distancing, and especially since we know that people can be asymptomatic and still be spreading the disease. And that's yeah. why it, it's just so important that people stay home. Terribly important. All right, let's get back to Hill Perkins. He's got the next question. All right, Devin, thank you. Big news in Detroit today, a groundbreaking clinical trial of a drug that could prevent or treat COVID-19. Hydroxychloroquine is going to be tested on thousands of first responders. But there are local patients who tell me that this same drug saved their lives. Where does the state stand regarding so-called unproven treatments, especially when a patient might otherwise die? Well, I think that we want to be on the front edge of making um, making history here by testing things, by acknowledging where there is possibility and making sure that we are uh, continue to own the um, lane of being innovators, right? Uh, we recognize, though, that this, this drug, and I think this is where there was some initial question about what our policy was going to be, um, is a drug that is taken by patients currently, and the fear that... Um, a pronouncement at the federal level might create some hoarding was something that we were very concerned about because we do have Michigan patients that have been prescribed this drug pre-COVID-19 that we wanted to make sure still had access to the medication. But I think that, as we know, um, this is a novel virus and we have to have the mindset that uh, we're going to be willing to explore what possibilities there are in terms of improving testing, in terms of testing for antibodies on the other side so we know who, are, who is immune, testing drugs and therapies in the process. And um, I think that there is some, some great potential here amidst all of the sadness and hardship that we're going through right now. And I would invite Dr. Khaldun to weigh in on this because I know she's quite studied on it as well. Thank you, Governor. Yeah, it, it's really exciting, actually, what's going on at Henry Ford Health System and the fact that they will be doing uh, this trial. As the governor mentioned, this is a new virus. We don't exactly know uh, how it works, how it works in the human body, uh, who's going to be immune, what medications might work against it. So it's really important that we aggressively pursue these clinical trials so we can understand what could potentially prevent people from getting it and, and treating them if they do have it. Dr. Khaldun, you have worked in the emergency rooms of several hospital systems. And I guess the main question for you is, when is it appropriate to try a drug that may and may not work on a patient who is facing death? Even though it may not have well, FDA approval. Well, certainly uh, in medicine, 
And certainly, uh, first, do no harm. So you certainly, as a practicing physician, do not want to be trying things that would potentially harm your patient. Uh, but we, as, as physicians, we have to pay attention to the science and the data, pay attention to what the FDA is saying. And if we uh, believe that something could potentially help a patient, then by all means, we, we should be attempting it. And I know that is what's going on uh, in hospitals across the country. Dr. Calhoun, thank you. Carolyn? All right, thank you, Huell. Dr. Caldoun, this question is for you. In the city of Detroit, we know there's a 36% poverty rate. Is this exposing a lack of health care? So many people in Detroit, so many people in Wayne County are coming down with COVID-19. I mean, what should we be telling them to walk around with masks at this point? Or how are we going to flatten the curve, as we keep saying? So it, it certainly is concerning what we're seeing in southeast Michigan, but not just the city of Detroit, but Oakland County and Wayne County uh, outside of Detroit, as you mentioned. The most important thing that we can be doing is, is, is really making sure people understand no one is immune. They have to be, uh, again, heeding these social distancing uh, measures. And, and again, at, at this point, it just came out from the federal government, the CDC today. Uh, if people have access to a homemade mask, then you know, it's probably a good idea to wear one. We don't want the general public wearing the N95 mask and the surgical mask. We, we do need to reserve those uh, for our frontline hospital workers. But right now, it, it's probably a good idea. If, if you have a mask, if you've got a cloth mask at home, you, you should probably be putting it on. And again, washing hands thoroughly with soap and water frequently. Uh, cleaning uh, frequently touched surfaces often, and most importantly, staying home. If you're not going out to get food, to get important medicine, uh, or you're a critical infrastructure worker, you absolutely should be staying home, and that's the only way you're going to be able to fight this virus successfully. You're right about that, Dr. Dundee. And I have a question from one of our viewers. Rebecca from Dundee says, if you want all of us to stay home, uh, why don't you make non-essential jobs essential? My husband makes car parts. No one needs them right now. Stop the companies from making people work when not needed. Governor, we get many calls regarding uh, what has been deemed essential versus non-essential. What should people do who have concerns like Rebecca's when they really shouldn't be at work. Yeah, so I think that this is an unprecedented time and it's required unprecedented decisions. And uh, the question of essential versus non-essential is something that I know has created a lot of um, questions. Here's how we look at it. If it's not a life-sustaining activity, if it's not providing someone's energy, or it's not providing someone's food, or their ability to get their pharmaceuticals, or their health care, then it's, it's probably not, you know, essential. And uh, fixing someone's car, though, so that they can continue to travel uh, does fall into that essential category. It's not perfect, it's not clean, it's not perhaps even um, obvious to everyone what all of the, the gray areas are. But I would say this to her husband's um, employer. Don't play fast and loose with what is essential and what's not essential. If it is meeting someone's needs so that they can get back on the road to get to the grocery store in this, uh, you know, in this stay home um, moment, then that is an essential thing. But if it is producing car parts and showing up and keeping your staff out and about and exposing them, that's playing fast and loose then. While the most um, majority of our Michigan businesses are doing the right thing and are interpreting this uh, conservatively, those who are questioning, um, I think, need to really uh, not play fast and loose. Every business in the state, most of whom have licenses with the state, don't want to put that in jeopardy. They don't want to rack up fines. And most importantly, I know that they don't want to expose their employees to COVID-19. This disease does not discriminate. It doesn't discriminate between state lines. It doesn't discriminate between party lines. It doesn't discriminate. And that's precisely why it's so important that every single one of us takes this seriously and does our part. The distancing is truly the best way that we can pe keep people safe. And I understand the economic anxiety that people have and that businesses have. But here's what I know. 
not doing everything we can now will just extend how long we are confronting this. It will just expose more people to sickness and more lives will be lost. And that's precisely why we have to be aggressive and we count on everyone to do their part. Thank you so much, Governor, and thank you as well, Dr. Caldoun. Devin, I'm going to send it to you. Yeah, and I'm going to stay on the essential issue here, Governor, and maybe go to the other side of the essential question. I heard from a lot of people whose jobs are not uh, described as essential, and yet they feel they could easily stay working and employed and keep a very small part of the economy moving, uh, given the nature of their jobs. These are people who are in the landscaping business or yard work. I heard from a guy who's a contractor who, when he is working in a house, he's in an, he's the only one in the house. He's by himself in a in a house that's under construction. So I think there are some people wondering if there's some room for some common sense on jobs that are not essential, but nonetheless could still be at work. Just having people move around is creating spread of COVID-19. Mm. As Dr. Jay mentioned, um, touching, you know, whether it's touching the, the gas station, you know, the, when you're filling up your car, or it's the door handle, COVID-19 can stay there for a while. And that's precisely why every time you're out and about, you're getting exposed to COVID-19. That's why every time that you're out and about unnecessarily, you're risking other people's health as well. That contractor who um, says that they're not gonna see another living soul the whole day that they go to work, well, is going to touch a few things along the way and is gonna go home. I think that the story that um, really kind of hit this home for me was that uh, the description of a woman who had COVID-19 and had very few symptoms, hardly even knew that she was sick, but got tested. Um, she, her husband ended up getting COVID-19 and he had incredible symptoms and passed away from it. Mm -hmm. Two people in the same house, very young, healthy people otherwise. One had a very mild reaction and for the other, it was deadly. This is the point. A seemingly healthy person who is moving around, who is asymptomatic, can be spreading COVID-19, and it grows exponentially. Without real robust testing, we have to assume that everyone is capable of carrying that and that everyone, in fact, is. And that's precisely why these really strict guidelines are what um, are all of the best medical expertise tells us we need to do. This is how we flatten the curve. The more porous we make our policy, the more exceptions there are, the longer we are going to be confronting this, the more people that will get sick and the more people that will die. Well, then let me ask you about an exception to that, because I also had a number of questions about why the lottery is deemed essential. That involves people standing in line, often waiting for a ticket, and then a hand-to-hand -hand transfer of the ticket itself. Uh, why is the lottery still up and running? Well, the lottery is not deemed essential, but it is something that is um, sold at, at convenience stores, which are deemed essential. Um, I have become aware of the serious concern about people congregating around uh, the lottery, and that's something that we're taking a very serious look at. It is important, though, that every single uh, business owner who has uh, who is selling food or um, essential, you know, needs meeting essential needs is taking the appropriate responsible steps to ensure that uh, the, the people that are coming into their stores are standing six feet apart. We see whether you're going to Meyer or Kroger or you're in uh, another kind of um, grocery store that they're putting X's on the ground so people understand yeah. how far six feet is, what yeah. that social distancing is. But with regard to the lottery specifically, I don't know that any states have taken action on this front, but it is something that has been um, raised and that we are looking very seriously at. All right, let's send it back over to Huel Perkins. Huel. Devin, thank you. Uh, Governor, the city of Flint has declared a nighttime curfew as the number of cases continues to rise in Michigan. Do you envision a statewide curfew? No, I don't at this juncture, Huel. Um, I think that, you know, Mayor Neely knows his community well and has made a decision that he thinks is in the best interest of, of um, keeping people from congregating. And, and I, I trust his judgment when it comes to the city of Flint. I think 
as we look statewide and we look to where um, we have people congregating, they are in um, smaller groups, uh, they are in private homes, which is a problem. People should not be doing that. That is uh, opposed, that, you know, that is in violation of the order. And, and you know, we are looking at how do we enforce. Uh, but in terms of a statewide curfew, we haven't uh, determined that that, ne that step is necessary at this juncture. Governor, most of us are complying with your order, but there are also viewers who complain about seeing people on their street throwing parties, uh, walking hand in hand through parks. There are even beer kegs uh, in some locations. How intent are you on enforcing the rules? How far are you willing to go? Uh, tickets, fines, jail? Well, I'll tell you, the best thing that we have going for us is that the vast majority of people are taking this very seriously. They're doing the right thing. They've gotten educated about how serious this threat is, or they know someone who's already uh, succumbed to, to COVID-19, and they're taking it very seriously. And they're putting peer pressure on others to do the same. We know that people that are out there and congregating and and flouting the order are putting others at risk, and that it is incredibly um, misinformed to continue that kind of behavior. We also know that we do have some tools for enforcement that that we will use, whether it is a fine or it is just simply being dispersed from a gathering. Uh, but there are, I think we've seen other states take some more aggressive measures and that's always possible. But what I wanna do is applaud the people that are doing the right thing. As I mentioned in that New York Times article and you look at the mapping of how little people are moving, we're doing it well in Michigan. It doesn't mean we're perfect, we're not, uh, but we're gonna continue to strive to make sure that everyone's abiding by that in one another's best interest and in our own. The less congregating that you're doing, you can't spread the virus. One scientist said, if everyone would pause, freeze in place for 14 days, this virus would come sputtering to a halt. So anyone who's concerned about the, getting the economy back up and running, getting our kids in schools, making sure that um, we can resume normal life at some point, needs to be doing their part right now and be aggressively obeying the stay home order and encouraging and demanding that all of their loved ones and all of their neighbors and people in their communities are doing so as well. Governor, thank you. Carolyn? Thank you so much, Huel. Uh, you know, Governor, you just mentioned the economy. Many people are terrified right now of even thinking about another recession like we had in 2008 or even worse. What do you encourage people to do right now to help our economy if they can? I mean, business owners are, are losing uh, money and feeling like they will never be able to open again. I mean, a lot of people need hope right now. Yeah, well, there's no question, Carolyn, that we are all gonna be concerned about the economy, whether it was someone who got laid off or someone who owns a business or someone who has to run the state budget, frankly. Every one of us is going to um, be dealing with, you know, the consequence of COVID-19. And it's not just a, a Michigan issue, nationwide and globally, frankly, that's the case. It's precisely why it's so important that we do everything we can right now to mitigate how long we're confronting this and the, how drastically it takes a toll on our healthcare system and on our ability to save lives. Um, I know I sound like a broken record, but I think it's, it bears worth repeating. The worst thing we could do for our economy is not take aggressive steps and watch this play out over a much longer course. It would be bad for our economy if we didn't pay attention to science and make decisions so that we're smart about when we ramp back up. We're seeing in other nations that there is a second wave of COVID-19. That would be devastating if we think we've come out of the woods, we went back to life as normal and then found out we're right back in the same spot again. We can't let that happen. That's precisely why aggressive action right now is essential. Making informed decisions as we are moving through when we get to the apex and beyond, which we're not even at yet. Some are saying it's another three to five weeks from now. 
The fact of the matter is, we have to do the right thing right now, knowing that that will ultimately be what's in the best interest of our economy in the long haul. Absolutely. Uh, my next question is for Dr. Calhoun. Uh, speaking of the numbers, I mean, today we hit 10,000 uh, cases of COVID-19 here in Michigan. How far do we think this is going to go? I heard the president talk about uh, 2 million people possibly getting it and America losing, what, 100 to 200,000 people. Do we have an idea of what kind of numbers we're talking about here in Michigan? So right now, like you said, we've been seeing an increase in over a thousand cases a day uh, here in Michigan over the past few days. And again, unfortunately, we've been behind when it comes to testing. We didn't get the testing supplies from the federal government. Uh, they're helping us, certainly, but uh, we have not had enough supplies. We have not had enough swabs. We have not had enough testing reagents. What we know is that it is going to continue to swell, and we expect to see a peak in the number of cases in anywhere to, from four to five weeks. Uh, but what's important to note is that even when we hit that apex, even when we start coming down, there will still be a lot more cases and there will still be many more deaths. Uh, it's important that people are patient. We know that social distancing works, so everyone needs to be patient and continuing to stay at home as much as possible so we can limit the number of cases and the number of deaths as much as possible. Yes, and I hope we are all heeding the warnings. Thank you so much, Dr. Caldoun. So appreciate you. Devin, the next question is yours. Let's, uh, Governor, I'd like to talk to you about the prisons. Uh, a prison is a very dangerous place for a COVID outbreak or even just the fear of one. We've watched other states that are uh, releasing some inmates. Uh, I, I'm, talk a little bit about what you think we need to do in the Michigan prison system to address this crisis. Yeah, so we've been very concerned about um, anyone in the state custody, frankly. Uh, we aggressively started by changing how we would be transporting prisoners between uh, county jails and the prison, knowing that uh, we've got aggressive measures on the front end to preclude anyone from coming into our prisons and also testing procedures to ensure that uh, we are limiting our exposure to COVID-19. I think we're seeing right now in New York, um, a, a, this is a real issue and it's growing in Michigan as well. We are testing, we are acknowledging, we are um, taking people out of the population, but this is something that once it's in it, it's very difficult to contain. I have great confidence in Director Washington and our incredible corrections officers who are um, some of the unsung frontline people who are putting a lot at risk to, for everyone's benefit, just like nurses and the people that are stocking our shelves at the grocery store and the janitors who are cleaning up um, to make sure things are sanitized. And so this is something that um, we are continuing to investigate. We've got more testing in Michigan than I think any other state is doing on that front in particular. Mm. And that's why I think our numbers are um, uh, concerning but I think it's, we've got a much more uh, accurate handle on, on the prevalence and we're gonna continue to do that. As we assess who may or may not um, still need to be in the general population and what uh, temporary measures might be taken, we are um, looking to see what other places have done so that we're learning best practices and yeah. we come up with uh, a solution if that's the right thing that for us to do right now. All right, we're gonna try and find time for one more question here. So let's send it back over to Huel. Uh, Governor, I want to make this quick. Everybody wants to know, banquet halls, caterers, families, where is the finish line? What will this look like? Is there a plan to reopen the state all at once or gradually based on the number of infections in any particular area? Yeah, so I think that's the question that no one can answer uh, with, with great confidence. Here's what we know. We need more testing, and when we are able to do more testing, we'll have a much better handle on truly how rampant COVID-19 is. When we are able to better assess how many people are being hospitalized, that will be another data point that will be critical to determining how and when we're able to start thinking about ramping up. 
I've got, um, in addition to Dr. Caldoun, who is one of the finest medical minds in the state, I'm listening to a lot of experts so that as we are looking at our healthcare system and making informed decisions that we know what we're really confronting. In combination, I've got a group of people that are helping me look at all of the different sectors in our economy to determine what a responsible ramp up might look like when we feel it's comfortable, and that's the healthcare side for, goes first. And so we're looking at all of these. I mentioned that we've seen a second wave in other countries. That would be the worst thing is to think we're out of the woods and just assume we've gone back to life as normal. We have to be smart. We have to make decisions based on the best science and always centered around what's in the best interest of the public health because those things are fundamentals when it comes to getting our economy back on track. All right, Governor, this is whisked right by as we expected it would, but before we wrap things up, we want to send it back to you for uh, one final message for the people of Michigan tonight. Well, thank you, and thank you all for tuning in. You know, we know that tough times don't last, but tough people do. We've been through a lot here in Michigan. We've been through crisis before where the country needed their countrymen and countrywomen to pitch in collectively to get through a crisis and rise to the occasion. Michigan once was the arsenal of democracy to win World War II. We need that same spirit now. We're working around the clock with doctors and hospitals and first responders to stop the spread and to save lives, but we need your help too. The state has launched a new volunteer website at www.michigan.gov forward slash fight COVID-19 where trained medical professionals can register to serve their fellow Michiganders by assisting hospitals in fighting COVID-19. State residents can also use the site to find out how they can help in their local communities by giving blood or donating resources or needed medical supplies. Whether you're a medical professional looking to volunteer or you're someone who can give blood or donate to your local food bank, everyone can help out. To get through this, we must all do our part. Stay home, stay safe, and save lives. We're definitely in this together. You know, we have reached the end of the hour, and I know there were many questions that were not able to be addressed this evening. That speaks to both the depth of the problem and to the amazing level of engagement of our Michiganders. Thank you for taking the time to get in touch with us and to share your questions with us. And for that, we are truly grateful. Indeed, we want to thank Governor Whitmer and Dr. Caldoun for being with us tonight. Yeah, this is indeed a rare moment. Think about it, reporters and anchors who usually compete against each other tonight on the same team in the same army fighting against the same enemy, this damn virus. I don't know how long this is going to take to win this battle, but we will win because the more we know, the stronger we are. Thank you. It's really true. We know in the deepest part of our minds that we're all Michiganders together. Tonight we really are, this program being broadcast from state line to state line across the UP uh, and all over this great state of ours. We're all joined certainly in the information of it tonight, but we're also all joined in what we're trying to fight. It's been unusual for the distancing that we're trying to keep from each other, which we had to pull off tonight, which is a challenge for a broadcast like this, but that too, a reminder of what we all must be doing right now to try to get an upper hand on this awful challenge. We thank you so much for spending this hour with us and for Carolyn Clifford and Huel Perkins and everyone at Fox 2 and Action 7 News and Local 4. I'm Devin Skillian. Stay safe and keep checking on the people you know and love. Good night from Detroit. That is going to wrap up our coverage of Governor Whitmer's live town hall. Make sure you go to OneDetroitPBS.org for all of our daily interviews, updates, and perspective on what is happening in Detroit and across our area during the COVID-19 crisis. These are unsettling times, and thanks for trusting Detroit Public Television to see you through it. For all of us at One Detroit, I'm Christy McDonald. Have a great night.